Have you ever felt weighed down by the expectations of society or been caught up in a whirlwind of worries about things beyond your control? If the answer is yes, then you're not alone. Many of us spend our lives caught in the trap of caring too much about things that, at the end of the day, might not matter as much as we think they do. But what if there were a way to break free from this cycle? A way to navigate life with more serenity and a clear mind? Today, we're diving deep into an exploration of a philosophical approach that might just hold the key to a happier, more fulfilling life. This approach, the art of not caring, is not about apathy or disregard for others, but rather, it's about focusing our care and attention where it truly matters, on things within our control, and letting go of the rest. In this video, we'll journey through the wisdom of various philosophies and philosophers who have walked this path before us and left guideposts for us to follow. From the tranquil mindfulness of Buddhist philosophy to the empowering self-sufficiency of Stoicism, from the hedonic calculus of Epicurus to the existential courage of Soren Kierkegaard, and from the life-affirming tenets of Nietzsche to the individualistic essence of existentialism. This exploration isn't just academic, we'll also discuss real-world applications and examples. We'll look at how these philosophies have been applied by individuals in the real world, and how not caring in the right way can lead to more happiness, less anxiety, and an overall more fulfilling life. But what exactly do we mean by not caring? In the philosophical sense, not caring doesn't mean complete detachment or lack of concern. It means liberating ourselves from the societal pressures, the fears of the unknown, the worries about what we can't control, and the anxiety over others' judgments. The art of not caring encourages us to focus our energy on our actions, our responses and our attitudes, rather than expending mental and emotional energy on things outside our realm of control. It's about recognizing our boundaries and deciding what truly warrants our care, our effort and our passion. It's about learning to embrace uncertainty, accept the impermanence of life, and still live joyfully in the present moment. If you've ever felt like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, if you've ever wished you could let go of anxieties that hold you back, or if you're just curious about different philosophical perspectives on happiness, you're in the right place. By the end of this journey, we hope you'll be armed with a new perspective on how to navigate life's ups and downs with grace, equanimity, and an untroubled mind. Stay with us as we unveil the liberating world of the art of not caring. It's time to venture on a philosophical journey of self-discovery and learn the art of letting go to live a happier, more fulfilling life. As we embark on this exploration, it's important to first set the stage by delving into the intrinsic link between philosophy and happiness. What role does philosophy play in defining and understanding happiness? Philosophy in its essence is the love of wisdom. It's an exploration of fundamental questions about existence, reality, knowledge, values, reason, and crucially for our discussion today, happiness. Philosophers across ages and cultures have grappled with the question of what happiness is and how it can be achieved. From ancient Greek philosophers to modern day thinkers, the quest for understanding happiness has always been at the heart of philosophical inquiry. Happiness is a concept that, on the surface, appears simple and universal. But once you dig deeper, it reveals a multidimensional nature that is deeply subjective and complex. Our understanding of happiness is usually tied to our personal experiences, cultural background and societal expectations. However, when we shift our focus from a personal lens to the broad vista of philosophy, the meaning of happiness expands and deepens. So, how do different philosophical perspectives view happiness? Let's start with the ancient Greeks. For Aristotle, one of the most influential philosophers of all time, happiness wasn't a fleeting emotion or a state of momentary joy. He proposed the concept of eudaimonia, often translated as flourishing or the good life. For Aristotle, happiness was about living a life of virtue and wisdom, fulfilling one's potential and contributing to society. It wasn't about chasing pleasure, but about cultivating a rich inner life. In contrast, 
The philosopher Epicurus viewed happiness as the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. However, Epicurean philosophy doesn't advocate hedonistic indulgence. Epicurus emphasized the simple, natural pleasures in life like friendship, intellectual pursuits, and peace of mind. Fast forward to the 17th and 18th centuries during the Age of Enlightenment, and we encounter utilitarian philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. They proposed that happiness is about maximizing pleasure for the greatest number of people, forming the basis of their moral and ethical guidelines. In the 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher, offered a less optimistic view. He believed that life is filled with suffering and happiness is merely the absence of this suffering. Schopenhauer's philosophy advocates for reducing desires to minimize disappointment and pain, giving a different spin on our understanding of happiness. Then we have the existentialists of the 20th century, like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, who believed that life inherently has no meaning, and it's up to each individual to create their own purpose and define their own happiness. They rejected societal norms and encouraged authenticity and personal freedom. And we can't forget the Eastern philosophical traditions like Buddhism, which teaches that happiness is achieved through the elimination of desire and attachment, leading to a state of inner peace and enlightenment. What's evident from these various philosophical perspectives is that happiness isn't a one-size-fits-all concept. It is deeply personal and intricately woven with our values, choices, and understanding of the world. Different philosophies offer different pathways to happiness, whether it's through virtue, pleasure, the absence of pain, personal freedom, or spiritual enlightenment. In today's exploration of the art of not caring, we will see how letting go of certain cares aligns with these diverse philosophical perspectives on happiness. It's about finding a balanced and thoughtful approach to what we choose to care about, ultimately leading us towards a fulfilling and content life. It's crucial to remember that philosophy doesn't provide ready-made answers, but guides us in asking the right questions. As we delve deeper into the art of not caring, let's keep an open mind, challenge our preconceptions, and allow these diverse philosophical teachings to enlighten our understanding of happiness. Let's set forth on this intriguing journey, drawing lessons from famous philosophers and their profound insights into happiness. Now let's turn our attention to Stoicism, an ancient Greek philosophy that has regained popularity in recent years for its profound wisdom and practical insights into living a good life. Stoicism was founded in Athens by Zeno of Sidium in the early 3rd century BC, but it was the later Stoic philosophers like Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius whose teachings have stood the test of time and continue to resonate with us today. Stoicism is a philosophy of personal ethics that emphasizes virtue, reason, and self-discipline. It teaches that we can't control everything that happens to us, but we can control how we respond. Stoicism encourages us to focus on what's within our power and let go of what's not, providing a powerful framework for the art of not caring. This brings us to the Stoic concept of the dichotomy of control. Epictetus, a former slave-turned-philosopher, articulated this principle eloquently in his Enchiridion, or Handbook. He wrote, Some things are within our power while others are not. Within our power are opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever is of our own doing. Not within our power are our body, our property, reputation, office, and, in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. This profound dichotomy reminds us to invest our time, energy, and emotions in areas of our life we can control, and practice indifference or not caring about the rest. This is not an encouragement towards passivity or neglect of responsibilities. Instead, it invites us to discern the things that are truly significant and worthy of our attention and care. It's about choosing not to be disturbed by life's uncontrollables, hence preserving our peace of mind 
and aligning ourselves with the natural order of the universe, a core Stoic principle. Stoicism's embodiment of the art of not caring can be seen in Marcus Aurelius's meditations. As a Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius had an abundance of power and influence, yet his writings reflect an understanding of the fleeting nature of these external goods. He wrote, Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. He often emphasized the importance of inner peace and tranquility over external achievements or recognition, embodying the stoic art of not caring about things outside our control. Seneca, another influential Stoic philosopher, further exemplifies this principle in his letters. He taught that we should remain indifferent to external circumstances, not allowing ourselves to be excessively disturbed by adversity or overly excited by prosperity. In one of his letters he wrote, True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future, not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient for he that is so wants nothing. By practicing Stoic principles, we learn to not care about the ever-changing circumstances of our lives and instead focus on cultivating our character, wisdom and virtue. We learn to be content with what we have undisturbed by external happenings and at peace with the world. The art of not caring in the Stoic sense is not about being indifferent to everything. It's about knowing where to best direct our care and attention for a fulfilling and tranquil life. Now, we move from the Stoic school of thought to the Garden of Epicurus. Epicurus, an ancient Greek philosopher who founded the school of philosophy known as Epicureanism, offers another perspective on the art of not caring. Contrary to common misconceptions, Epicureanism isn't about indulging in physical pleasures or leading a life of luxury. Instead, it's about understanding the nature of pleasure and desire and leading a life of tranquility, freedom and friendship. Epicurus taught that pleasure is the highest good and the end goal of life, but he also emphasized that not all pleasures are worth pursuing. He differentiated between kinetic pleasures, which arise from satisfying a desire, and catastomatic pleasures, which are the peaceful state of contentment when we are free from pain and desire. According to Epicurus, the best life is one where we can maintain a state of catastomatic pleasure, enjoying the simple joys of life without being constantly driven by desires. A significant aspect of Epicureanism, related to the art of not caring, is its stance on societal expectations and material desires. Epicurus advocated for a simple life, away from the hustle and bustle of Athenian society. He believed that many of our desires, such as the desire for wealth, fame or power, are instilled in us by societal expectations and are neither natural nor necessary. These desires, according to Epicurus, often lead to more pain than pleasure, as they are insatiable and keep us in a constant state of want. Epicurus famously wrote, If thou wilt make a man happy, add not unto his riches, but take away from his desires. This insightful perspective encourages us to not care about the pursuit of material wealth or societal status, and instead focus on cultivating inner tranquility and fostering meaningful relationships. Another fascinating teaching from Epicurus is his view on fear, particularly the fear of death. He argued that death is nothing to us, as when we exist, death is not, and when death exists, we are not. By dispelling the fear of death, Epicurus encourages us to not care about this inevitable aspect of life, allowing us to live more freely and joyfully in the present moment. So, how can these principles lead to a happier life? By understanding the nature of our desires, distinguishing between necessary and unnecessary ones, and learning to manage them effectively, we can achieve a state of contentment and inner peace. By choosing not to care about societal expectations or the fear of death, we liberate ourselves from unnecessary worries and anxieties, creating room for true joy and tranquility. Through Epicureanism, 
we learn that happiness doesn't come from external possessions or status but from an inner state of peace, free from pain and turmoil. This philosophy teaches us to celebrate the simple pleasures of life, friendship, thought and freedom from fear and desire, giving us a valuable perspective on the art of not caring. The Epicurean way of life invites us to rethink our values and desires, to let go of societal expectations and needless worries, and to embrace the simple and enduring pleasures of life. As we further our journey, let's carry these insights from Epicurus with us. Let's appreciate the role of pleasure and desire in our lives, and learn to care less about things that don't contribute to our lasting happiness. As we continue this philosophical exploration of the art of not caring, we journey next to the 19th century Denmark and meet Soren Kierkegaard, widely recognized as the father of existentialism. Kierkegaard, unlike the philosophers we've discussed so far, lived in a completely different era and cultural context. Kierkegaard's existential philosophy focuses on the individual, their emotions, freedom, choice, and subjective existence. He believed that truth is subjective and that each individual must navigate the complexities of life independently. His writings present a deep dive into human psychology, exploring themes of anxiety, despair, and the quest for meaning. One of Kierkegaard's most famous concepts is the leap of faith. In the face of life's uncertainties and paradoxes, Kierkegaard proposed that one must make a leap of faith into the religious life to find purpose and overcome despair. Now while the leap of faith has religious connotations, especially in Kierkegaard's writings, the underlying concept extends beyond the religious sphere. It's about embracing uncertainty, about having the courage to make decisions without full knowledge of what the outcome might be. So much of our daily stress and anxiety stems from uncertainty we fret about the future, worry about the unpredictable, and struggle to make decisions when we can't foresee the consequences. But what if we choose to not care about this uncertainty? What if we take that leap of faith, accept the uncertainty, and make our choices with conviction and courage? Kierkegaard wrote, Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. In the context of our discussion, this quote is a reminder that while we can reflect on our past experiences to gain understanding and wisdom, we can't predict or control the future. Thus, choosing to not care about future uncertainties doesn't mean being reckless or indifferent to outcomes. Instead, it's about freeing ourselves from the paralyzing fear of the unknown, allowing us to live fully in the present and act according to our values and beliefs. Embracing Kierkegaard's leap of faith could lead us to greater happiness by liberating us from the burdens of anxiety and fear. When we stop caring excessively about the uncertainties, we can focus our energy on the present moment and on the actions that align with our values. By doing so, we give ourselves the freedom to lead an authentic life, one where we are not constantly overwhelmed by what might happen in the future. Kierkegaard's existential philosophy invites us to reflect deeply on our individual existence, our anxieties, and our freedom. His concept of the leap of faith provides us with a strategy to deal with life's uncertainties, not by attempting to predict or control the future, but by courageously embracing these uncertainties and focusing on our authentic self. Let's leap bravely into the uncertainties of life, caring less about what we can't control and more about living authentically and fully in the present. From the bustling streets of 19th century Denmark, our philosophical journey takes us east to ancient India, where Siddhartha Gautama, known as the Buddha, introduced a profound philosophy and path to spiritual enlightenment, Buddhism. Buddhism a non-theistic tradition offers a unique perspective on happiness, suffering, detachment, and the art of not caring about the transient and impermanent. Buddhism defines happiness differently than many Western philosophies. Instead of equating happiness with pleasure or the satisfaction of desires, 
Buddhism views true happiness as a deep, enduring state of well-being and contentment that arises from inner peace and wisdom. This happiness is independent of external circumstances and is accessible to everyone through mindfulness, ethical conduct and understanding the nature of reality. Central to Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths, which outline the nature of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation. The Buddha taught that suffering arises from tanha, or craving, an insatiable thirst for something other or more than what is. This craving is born from our ignorance of the true nature of reality, characterized by impermanence, dissatisfaction, and non-self, this brings us to the Buddhist principles of detachment and non-attachment, which are pivotal to understanding the art of not caring from a Buddhist perspective. Detachment in Buddhism does not mean indifference or avoidance of life's experiences. Instead, it's a deep understanding and acceptance of the impermanent nature of all phenomena. It's about not clinging to people, things, experiences or even ideas knowing that they are subject to change and dissolution. Non-attachment goes hand in hand with detachment. It is a state of freedom from the compulsive need to hold on to things, experiences or ideas. When we practice non-attachment, we fully engage with life as it unfolds, experiencing joy, sadness, pleasure and pain without being enslaved by these transient feelings. We learn to care deeply about life while not being bound by it. By not caring about impermanent things, we are not rejecting or devaluing them. Instead, we are learning to relate to them in a healthier way, experiencing them fully, appreciating them while they last, but not suffering when they change or vanish. This perspective, when applied to life, can lead to a profound inner peace and happiness. It helps us to enjoy the beauty of life's changing seasons without being swept away by the storms of craving, aversion or delusion. The Buddha said, you only lose what you cling to. This simple yet profound statement encapsulates the essence of Buddhist detachment and non-attachment. It invites us to let go, to stop caring excessively about that which is inherently transient and ungraspable. In doing so, we free ourselves from much of the self-inflicted suffering and open the door to a deeper, more enduring form of happiness. Buddhism, with its profound insights into the nature of reality and the human mind, offers valuable guidance on the art of not caring. By understanding and practicing the principles of detachment and non-attachment, we can learn to navigate life with greater peace, clarity and freedom. As we continue our exploration, let us remember the Buddha's wisdom. Let us remember that everything is subject to change and that by not clinging to transient things, we can attain a state of inner peace and enduring happiness. After all, isn't that what we're all striving for? Our philosophical exploration now leads us back to Europe, this time to Germany in the late 19th century where we meet one of the most influential and controversial philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche. Known for his critiques of traditional morality and his philosophy of life affirmation, Nietzsche provides us with a powerful lens through which to view the art of not caring. At the heart of Nietzsche's philosophy is the concept of life affirmation, which he believed to be the highest state of being human. To affirm life, according to Nietzsche, is to embrace existence as it is, with all its contradictions, uncertainties and challenges. It's about saying yes to life, not in a passive or resigned way, but with a sense of joy, curiosity and creativity. This philosophy of life affirmation ties in closely with Nietzsche's views on societal norms and the art of not caring. Nietzsche believed that societal norms and traditional morality often hinder individuals from living fully and authentically. He criticized herd morality the notion that good and bad are universally applicable to everyone. For Nietzsche, not caring about societal norms and traditional morality isn't about becoming indifferent or apathetic. Rather, it's about self-overcoming, a process through which individuals transcend their conditioned behaviors and beliefs to create their values. When we stop caring about societal expectations, we can begin to question, critique, 
and eventually overcome these imposed values. This allows us to become the authors of our moral code, defining what is meaningful, worthwhile, and fulfilling for us. Here, we encounter the concept of the Ubermensch, often translated as the Overman or Superman. This concept represents Nietzsche's ideal individual who has successfully overcome themselves, creating their values and affirming life in all its complexity. The Ubermensch embodies the principle of not caring about conventional morality, choosing instead to embrace life with all its chaos and uncertainty and to create their moral framework. Nietzsche wrote in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, I teach you the Overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? These powerful words are a call to action. They challenge us to question, to strive, to create. They remind us of our capacity for self-overcoming, our potential to become who we truly are. So what does Nietzsche's philosophy offer in our quest to master the art of not caring? It invites us to reevaluate our relationship with societal norms and traditional morality. It encourages us not to care about these external expectations in a way that stifles our individuality, but instead to create our values and affirm life as it is. As we move forward in our exploration, let's remember Nietzsche's powerful ideas. Let's strive for self-overcoming, dare to create our values, and learn to affirm life in all its complexity. As we continue our philosophical journey, we now find ourselves immersed in the 20th century, in a world still grappling with the aftermath of two world wars, a world in which existentialism was born. This philosophical movement, characterized by its emphasis on individuality, freedom, and personal responsibility, offers a fresh perspective on living a happy and fulfilled life. Existentialism with roots in the works of Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, came into its own with philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Rejecting traditional philosophical categories, existentialism focuses on the individual, the concrete human being, as it grapples with anxiety, freedom, authenticity, and the absurd. At the heart of existentialism is the belief in the primacy of individual existence. As Sartre famously said, existence precedes essence, meaning that we first exist and it's through our actions, choices and experiences that we define who we are. This freedom to create ourselves is both empowering and daunting. It places the responsibility for our lives squarely on our shoulders, making us the authors of our destiny. Closely tied to this emphasis on individual freedom is the existentialist view on the absurdity of life. As articulated by Albert Camus in his works, life is inherently devoid of meaning, purpose or order. It is absurd. This realization can lead to despair, or it can liberate us. By not caring about the absurdity, by accepting it, we are freed from the futile search for external meaning or validation. Instead, we can focus on creating our meaning, carving out our path in the face of the absurd. This theme is beautifully explored in Camus' myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus, condemned to eternally roll a boulder up a hill, only to have it roll back down, embodies the human condition in the face of the absurd. But as Camus suggests, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. By not caring about the futility of his task, Sisyphus can find joy and meaning in the process itself, in his struggle and persistence. So, what do existentialist philosophers like Sartre and Camus offer us in our exploration? They remind us that we are free, free to choose, to act, to create our essence. They teach us that life is absurd, and by not caring about this absurdity, we can liberate ourselves from external validation and create our meaning. They urge us to embrace our freedom, to take responsibility for our lives, and to carve out our path in the face of the absurd. As we've journeyed through the rich tapestry of philosophy, from Stoicism to Buddhism, from Nietzsche to Sartre and Camus, we've delved deep into the theoretical realms of the art of not caring. Now let's translate this theoretical wisdom into concrete action. 
How can we apply these philosophical lessons in our day-to-day -day lives? What are some practical steps we can take? First and foremost, we need to identify the things that we truly care about. Reflect on the stoic principle of the dichotomy of control. Separate the things in your life into those you can control and those you can't. The key is to focus our energies on what we can control, our thoughts, emotions, and actions, and learn to let go of the things outside our control. This simple act can drastically reduce unnecessary stress and anxiety, creating space for more joy, freedom, and fulfillment. This leads to our second point, embracing uncertainty. As Kierkegaard taught us, life is filled with uncertainties, and attempting to control or predict everything is not only futile, but can also lead to discontentment. By embracing uncertainty, by making that leap of faith, we can free ourselves from the fear and anxiety associated with the unknown. We start to see uncertainty as an opportunity for growth and transformation. The third step involves confronting societal expectations. As we learned from Epicurus, Nietzsche and existentialism, societal norms and expectations can often hinder our authenticity and happiness. Reflect on these pressures in your own life. Do they align with your values and desires, or are they stifling your individuality? Not caring about these societal expectations doesn't mean neglecting your responsibilities or becoming indifferent. Instead, it's about reclaiming your freedom to choose your path, to define your values, to create your essence. The fourth step invites us to sit with the absurdity of life. Drawing on the wisdom of Camus, we can acknowledge the inherent absurdity and embrace it. Instead of searching for external meaning or validation, focus on creating your meaning. This could be through your relationships, your passions, your work, or your personal growth. Find joy in the process, in your Sisyphean struggle. While these steps can guide us in our journey, applying these steps is not without its challenges. It's a lifelong journey, one that requires patience, courage and self-compassion. There might be moments of doubt, fear or confusion. Remember that it's okay to feel these emotions. They are part of the human experience. Instead of resisting them, acknowledge them, learn from them and let them guide you on your path. Now, you might be wondering, how can I put these ideas into practice right now? Well, mindfulness can be a powerful tool in this journey. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully present, of paying attention to the here and now without judgment. It allows us to observe our thoughts, emotions and sensations as they are without getting caught up in them. Try this simple mindfulness technique Take a few moments each day to sit in silence. Focus on your breath, on the sensation of the air entering and leaving your body. If your mind starts to wander, gently bring it back to your breath. This practice can help you cultivate a sense of presence, acceptance, and non-attachment, key elements in the art of not caring. Remember, not caring isn't about indifference or neglect. It's about discerning what truly matters, about embracing life with all its uncertainties and absurdities, about creating our essence in the face of societal expectations. It's a journey, not a destination, one that requires courage, self-compassion, and a willingness to embrace the fullness of our human experience. As we arrive at the end of this exploration of the art of not caring, it's time to pause, reflect, and perhaps set the stage for what's next. We have embarked on a fascinating journey through time, from the stoic sages of ancient Rome to the existentialist thinkers of the 20th century, exploring how these philosophical schools have approached the concept of not caring. We've explored the stoic principle of the dichotomy of control, learning that the path to tranquility and happiness lies in discerning what we can control from what we can't, and focusing our care and energy on the former. We delved into Epicurean philosophy, drawing insights from Epicurus's teachings on pleasure, desire, and the importance of not caring about societal expectations. We took a leap of faith with Kierkegaard, embracing the inherent uncertainties of life and understanding how not caring about certain outcomes can lead to a happier existence. 
we delved into the depths of Eastern philosophy, understanding how Buddhism's principles of detachment and non-attachment can help us let go of impermanent things, thereby leading to inner peace and happiness. Nietzsche pushed us to question societal norms, and through his life-affirming philosophy, taught us about the power of not caring about conforming to these norms in our journey towards self-overcoming. The existentialist philosophers, particularly Sartre and Camus, emphasized the absurdity of life and encouraged us to take responsibility for our own existence, reiterating how not caring about this inherent absurdity can lead to personal freedom. In the final section, we discussed how to apply these philosophical principles in daily life. We examined ways to identify what truly matters to us, how to embrace uncertainty, confront societal expectations, and sit with the absurdity of life. We also covered some potential challenges along the way and discussed a simple mindfulness technique to cultivate presence, acceptance, and non-attachment. However, this exploration is merely the beginning of your journey. The art of not caring is not a destination, but a lifelong practice, a path to follow. It requires patience, courage, and self-compassion. As you continue your exploration, remember to apply these philosophical insights to your own life, to discern what truly matters to you, and to not care about what doesn't serve your highest good. In the grand scheme of life, it's the lessons we learn, the insights we gain, and the people we touch that matter the most. So go forth and explore the art of not caring in your life. See what shifts it brings, what freedom it offers, what happiness it leads to. Remember, the journey towards not caring isn't about becoming indifferent or neglectful. It's about embracing your authenticity, reclaiming your freedom, and carving your path. It's about creating your essence in the face of societal expectations, uncertainties, and the inherent absurdity of life.